One brain cell that they're sharing world building did not exist. It ended up becoming a romance for some reason. The easiest one star that I've ever given out. It was like someone else wrote the end of the book. The bar is so low for tall white men. <laughs> Felt like I went to sleep to the office and then woke up to the haunting of Hill House. What's up y'all? Today we are going to be talking about some books that, say it with me kids, disappointed me the way my father disappointed me as a child. If you were abandoned as a kid, clap your hands. <laughs> but before that happens, we're gonna take a little break, kids, and shout out a jewelry company that we all know and love. That is none other than Ana Luisa, who has got me fitted in this video. Y'all know that I have been rocking hard with this company for many years now. Ana Luisa is a jewelry company with a sustainable mission. They offset 100% of their carbon emissions so that you can have guilt free jewelry, luxury items, but at an affordable price. What I love about this company is that they have something for absolutely everyone. They've got silver pieces, gold pieces, they have bold statement pieces, as well as things that are subtle and minimalistic that will simply complement any outfit. Their pieces start at just $39. They've sent me this awesome ring that I'm wearing on my thumb. It is like no ring I have ever seen before. This is a ring that's gonna start conversation. I'm in love with it. It's giving 1990s New York and it goes with every single thing that I put on. We also have this awesome scorpion necklace. This is part of their Zodiac line, which I highly recommend checking out. They have sent me this incredibly beautiful and simple gold chain. This is a really beautiful accent piece or you can stack it with other pieces. I myself am a big fan of wearing silver and gold together. So I have this chain paired with its silver twin and I simply love the way that these three chains look together. And to finish this look off, I am rocking these really cute dagger earrings. I feel that these look awesome with my short haircut and they also are a really good conversation starter. Now get yourself something nice or something for a loved one because y'all know it is the season. Use the code BOWTIES10 for 10 percent off your Ana Luisa order. All of the information, the nitty and the gritty about this amazing sustainable jewelry company is going to be right in that little description box down below. Now without further ado, let us get into the books that wasted my time. All right cuties, it is time for us to do some venting, some ranting, and just a little bit of dragging. We've got 14 books to get to, 14 books that wasted my time, that disappointed me, that let me down. So the first book that I'm going to be talking about, unfortunately, was one of my most anticipated books of the year by one of my favorite authors, an author that I started reading last year and fell head over heels with. This author is celebrated, more celebrated than I am on my freaking birthday, and that is none other than V.E. Schwab. V.E. Schwab is that incredible author who gave us so many books and series that we absolutely love. There is Addie LaRue, there is the Darker Shade of Magic series, there is the Vicious and the Victorious books. All of those books are just so highly celebrated, and the only ones of her books that I've read are Vicious and Addie LaRue. And I'm not gonna lie, those books were enjoyable to me. Addie LaRue, okay, I've got mixed feelings about it that we're gonna sort out in therapy. But Vicious, she became an auto-instant favorite. Absolutely love, love, love their writing style. So I was pretty geeked to get to their latest release, which is Gallant. We have a disabled main character. We have a creepy house. I could not possibly have been more excited for this book. And unfortunately, I ended up DNFing it. And it seems like I'm not the only one. Where do we start with Gallant? It, of course, has V.E. Schwab's signature fantastic writing, that atmospheric, gorgeous, lyrical, prose-heavy writing that keeps you wanting to absorb the story. I listened to Gallant on audio, and the audiobook narrator, I think, was not the right choice for the story. And apparently, this is the right time for Akasha to start drinking water. Thank you. 
This book had all of the makings of a fantastic story and I have one and only one question. Where was the plot? Did it get lost? Is it meandering through the woods? Is it eat, pray, loving around India? Where was the plot? And how do I bring her home? Let's talk about the villain of the story. Why was the villain of this book more absent than my father? I got more time with my trauma growing up than I did with this villain. How are you gonna introduce a villain like- What is a villain? Why did I turn into an ostrich? <laughs> Okay, how are you gonna introduce a villain so late in the game? There was so much about this book that just felt half-hearted. Now, I know that this is a book that the Ishwab is very proud of. I know that this is a book that the author put a lot of heart and soul into, but unfortunately, it just wasn't for me. I just didn't love the execution of the story. I did not love the plot because, again, I still haven't seen hide nor hair of her. And that is a criticism that I've heard many other people make as well. So I know I'm not the only one who feels this way, but what were your thoughts on Gallant? Let me know. Am I bugging? Am I totally insane? and what did you love about this book other than the writing? Like, yes, we know V.E. Schwab's writing is incredible. And despite that, I was still bored to tears. I was very, very bored, again, because we were just meandering. And if you like books that don't have a plot, you will very likely enjoy Gallant, but I was bored. And this is blurbed, described as a, as a YA. It was definitely giving middle grade. Where was the character work? I just, it just unfortunately wasn't for me, and I, um, I'm going to be looking forward to their next book and forgetting all about this one. Now let's talk about Social Creature. This is a book that I picked up because I was exploring my library's Libby and it popped up and I thought, oh, how interesting because it's described as this gossip girl meets gate yeah. Gossip Girl meets The Great Gatsby. It's very F. Scott Fitzgeraldian. It's supposed to be for fans of Donna Tartt and Gillian Flynn. And I was like, okay, let's, let's check this out. And the premise of it sounded interesting. The book opens up with us following Louise, who is a New Yorker who's got like nine jobs. She's struggling, just trying to make it on her own in New York City. She arrives to this babysitting gig in the Upper East Side and she meets Lavinia. Lavinia is glamorous and gorgeous and is a local celebrity. She is famous, her house is opulent beyond measure, and she is known as New York City's It Party Girl. And she meets Louise and is like, oh my god, let me take you under my wing and I'm gonna bring you to all these lavish parties and you're gonna be my new cute little sidekick. And the story, you find out like on page one that Lavinia is dead. So you know right away, what is happening behind me? was weird. Anyway, you know right away when the book starts that Lavinia is dead and so you are kind of trying to figure out how did she die? This is the most exhausting book that I have ever read. Vapid is an amazing way to describe these characters. Louise, Louise, I better not ever cross paths with this fictional girl and don't let me get started on Lavinia. Neither of these characters are supposed to be likable. You in the entire book are trying to figure out why people are so obsessed with Lavinia because she is terrible. She treats people horribly and she's very obviously not meant to be a good or honestly even a redeemable person and to be honest neither is Louise. Louise is an opportunist and you find out that she herself is maybe not the greatest of people. I could have maybe had some sympathy for Louise's character if she were not hell-bent on putting herself in situations that she didn't need to be in and more importantly not learning from those situations. There was no growth and so she was constantly making mistakes but drawing absolutely nothing from them and not growing as a person. But that is not why I hated this book so much. It wasn't because those characters weren't likable, it was because of the ending. I want to spoil this book so bad and describe what happened. So I'm going to do my very very best to describe what what happened without spoiling it. There is a situation with a suitcase. 
and our main character is carrying this suitcase around town towards the end of the book and when you find out what's in the suitcase the contents of the suitcase is my concern it's giving what the fuck it's giving 911 it's giving emergency. If you like books with characters that have one brain cell that they're sharing between the two of them, please read this. If you like books about lavishly wealthy people who are terribly people, who are terribly people, you might like this book. You really might. I didn't. Now we gotta talk about And There He Kept Her, and I sure wish we didn't have to. This is going to be a really good book if you liked the movie Don't Breathe. I did not like the movie Don't Breathe. This was not the book for me. This is a thriller and police procedural where we start off by following these two kids who break into this disabled old man's home and they find out that he's not as helpless as he might seem. Hmm, does that plot sound familiar? We are also following this new police man chief person who comes to town. What, what is he? I don't know cop structure. Is he the new chief of but sheriff? He's the sheriff. He's the sheriff. He's Woody from Toy Story and he's new into the small town and he is gay. He is struggling with people's treatment of a sexual identity and just trying to have his own privacy and getting to terms with what's getting up to speed on what's going on in the town as well as trying to figure out what happened to these two missing teenagers. So the teenagers at the start of the book, they break into his house and they go missing. And it's not a spoiler because you find out like right away instantly, one of them is killed and the other, the girl, is taken captive in the creepy guy's basement. So you're following all of those characters. You're following creepy guy, his lackey, you're following the sheriff and the girl who is not having a good time in his basement. I mean, she's not exactly at a party, you know what I'm saying? So this is a debut work from a gay male author and I was very, very excited about it because I do love Sorry, I felt like I was getting blurry. I do love my queer thrillers. I absolutely love, 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 love LGBTQ thrillers and racialized horror. Those are two like really big buzzwords for me. Some people had issues with the queer depiction, but honestly, from reading those people's reviews, it seemed like those people didn't realize that the author was gay and that they were assuming that the author was straight. They might have felt differently having not assumed the author's identity. I don't know but that is something I do want to bring out. Why didn't I like it though? First of all, the fat phobia. The villain is a large man, both in height and in weight, and he is described so cruelly at times that it just sickened me. I didn't like it. I don't need a, a character's fatness to be part of their evil. I didn't like that. I, I feel like we can do better and it just should not have happened. The second thing was the character himself is a sexual predator who is like retired from being a sexual predator, I guess. He's on a hiatus, I don't know. He, as a villain, some reviewers were like, oh my god, he was such a captivating and interesting character and the villains were so good. No, they were not. They were the most caricature villains that I have ever seen in fiction. They could not have been more cookie cutter stereotype. You have the lackey who has one brain cell who's calling the shots and he is very volatile and the other one who is smarter is trying to calm him down while the lackey does really really shitty things putting both of them at risk of being arrested. I guess I can't call him a lackey because he's actually the one calling the shots and making the other dude do what he wants. But long story short, neither of these villains were compelling. Neither of them were compelling. The most interesting character was the girl who was locked up in the basement. And honestly, in a lot of ways, she was just at the wrong place in, in, in the wrong time because she didn't want to be there in the first place. It was kind of her boyfriend's idea. And her boyfriend's name was Jesse. And thank God Jesse died really early on in the book so that he didn't have to suffer through everything that happened, including being a part of the book at all. Next up, we have Astrid Sees All. This girl saw everything but a therapist everything but a way to get out of her situation. I was so freaking disappointed by this book. So if you thought Social Creature sounds good, you will probably also think Astrid Sees All sounds good and vice versa because the two books, I honestly get them mixed up a lot. Astrid Sees All came out last year. It was one of my most highly, highly anticipated releases. It's set in the 80s and we're following the glitzy, glamorous lifestyle of just like working class New Yorkers who are partying in the 80s. You know, they're doing tons of drugs. They're struggling to make it day to day there's a the, you know it's kind of like romanticizing being poor and young in 
Brooklyn kind of thing. I think it's set in Brooklyn. And basically Astrid comes from a well-to-do family. They're not rich, but they're not poor and in upstate, I think. And she decides that she wants to make it on her own in New York City. And her family's like, you can't make it, you can't make it, you can't make it. And she's like, I can make it, I can make it, I can make it. And so she goes to New York and finds out, I can't make it, I can't make it, I can't make it. In order to survive, she gets a ton of jobs, just struggling, refusing to go home because she's, she's she wants to stick it out. She wants to prove that she's got the chops. And the only thing that was getting chopped was my brain while reading this book. We are following Astrid as she develops this obsession for a girl that she met in New York. Does this sound familiar? Girl is, I also believe, from a rich family, but has this decided that she's not gonna go home. So wild how similar the plot for Social Creature and Astrid Sees All is. Are? How similar the plots are. Excuse me. I hate English. So one of the ways that Astrid decides to support herself is by becoming a fortune teller and her ego, her alter ego is named Astrid. I forget her actual name because it doesn't matter. So she starts telling fortunes at clubs in New York City and she can tell everybody else's fortune but her own. And the reason that I hated this book so deeply was because it was trying to do something and not doing it. I don't know what it was trying to do but I can guarantee you it, it wasn't happening. And it follows one of my most despised tropes which is I don't know how to describe this so I'm just gonna try and work out my thoughts on camera and hope that it kind of makes sense I don't like stories where a character intentionally doesn't allow their parents to help them out and go through all of this suffering knowing that help is easily on the other side. It just, that just doesn't work for me. It would be a very different thing if these parents were abusive or had treated them poorly their whole life. But Astrid, throughout the book, she is like in drug houses. Her life is in danger. She's getting assaulted. She's in unsafe situations where her actual life is at stake, her life, her wellness, and her safety. And all she has to do is call her parents and ask for help or some advice, and she refuses to do that. That's just not a privilege that I've ever had in my life or been able to enjoy as somebody who did leave home when they were 18 years old and who has struggled but didn't have the, the privilege of being able to call home and ask for help. And so watching characters go through that unnecessarily it just it just doesn't speak to me and it just it just makes me roll my eyes and I know that there's gonna be a lot of people who are like oh well you know it's good that she wanted to make it on her own that kind of thing and I'm not saying that it's not I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that so don't think that's what I'm saying what I'm saying is I can't connect to those kinds of characters those kinds of stories flat out upset me because of my own life experiences they're not written for me and they are not for me if that makes sense so if those are the kinds of narratives that you like there's nothing wrong with it but for me personally i'm just like <sighs> it breaks my heart to talk about this next book it really really does it really really does and that book is none other than ninth house it breaks my heart to talk about this book because I knew damn well I wasn't gonna like this book. I knew it, but Jan insisted. Jan insisted that Ninth House was gonna be the book for me. And so I was like, you know what, homie? You know what, bestie? I'm gonna trust you. I should not have trusted Jan. This book, we all know. So everybody was hyping it like two years ago. Dark Academia, Set at Yale, Secret Society, Troubled Main Character, all that stuff. Checking all the boxes, you know what I'm saying? If you have been following me for a while, you'll know that Dark Academia is not a buzzword for me. It's not something that I really care about unless it is racialized or queer. These kind of popular Dark Academia stories, I just tend to not enjoy them for so many different reasons. Let me give Ninth House a chance. And it was, it was literally everything that I thought that it was going to be and I DNF'd it. I DNF'd it after trying to read it three times. <laughs> three times I tried to read this book cover to cover and when I tell you that I was bored, I really truly deeply mean that I was bored. The amount of boredom that I experienced while reading Ninth House seems literally impossible. I fell asleep reading this book so many times. Alex as a character did not interest me and I know that she was a big draw for so many of you while reading this. The whole secret society situation, that didn't interest me. The writing itself, it also didn't interest me. The issue that I had with Ninth House was that it utterly failed to capture my attention. And I think that a big part of the reason is because it's a me 
thing. This is not a, one of the books that I'm like, oh, it didn't do X, Y, and Z well. It is a flawed book. I think I'm just not the audience for it. And that's because I know my reading taste very, very well. Every now and again, I will have a book surprise me and I love when books surprise me. I absolutely love that. Like that's why we read books is to be surprised, right? Is to be challenged in some way or changed in some way. And I unfortunately was completely right about whether or not I was going to enjoy this book. I, I didn't. I knew when I looked at it that it wasn't for me, but I still gave it a shot. And lo and behold, it was not for me. Okay, I had to switch the ambiance that was playing behind me because there were so many ads on that one. How are you gonna have like a coffee shop soothing video and it's got ads throughout the whole thing? That don't make no damn sense. I think it's a good time to put an advertisement here. Yay. I would love to know though, what is a book that is really popular that you just knew right away was not for you? I really was hoping that I was wrong about Ninth House and that it really would be something that I ultimately enjoyed, but it just wasn't for me. Next up we have The Book of Night by Holly Black. I read this for an experiment video that I did where I read Booktube's most hated books of 2022. Now comment down below, let me know other books that Booktube has hated this year because I've done two videos for that series and I'm so down to do a third. I did one video where I read the most hated thriller on Booktube which was House Across the Lake by Riley Saker. That is linked down below and then I did one where I read I think five books and and Book of Night is one that made it into this video. I really did not like this book. I ended up selling my annotated copy over on my Pango, my bookstore, and I'm glad that it went to a better home because she did not have a place here. She literally could not sit with us. The Book of Night is Holly Black's adult debut. I would put this more at new adult than, you know, like adult adult. My biggest issue with this book, because I was one of the few people that actually did enjoy the main character, Charlie. I did like her. I thought that she was unlikable in a charming way. I thought that she did have a good heart to her, but yeah, she was pretty solid in her convictions, in her desire for revenge, and not getting fucked over. I thought that she was a pretty well-rounded, nuanced character. The thing that I didn't like about this book, the thing that really, really, I think, shot this book in its own foot, I don't know what happened there, was the fact that the world building did not exist. What we had was a brilliant concept with the shadow magic, right? Brilliant concept, shadow magic, and shadows influencing feelings, and shadows being able to manipulate things and a terrible execution because it felt like we had the bones of a magic system and then we just stuck with the bones and didn't develop the magic system so the urban fantasy element just didn't it just didn't pull through. I honestly think this would have been a stronger story if the magic had just been pulled from it because that's how haphazardly the magic was done. It was such a cool freaking concept and it kind of felt that Holly Black was just riding off of the awesome concept but not following through with it. Do you see what I'm saying? I don't know if that makes sense, but I don't think that the world building really did it. It felt very, very minimal. And just because it's an urban fantasy, does it mean that the world building can just slide? Does this make sense? I have read some incredible, incredible urban fantasies that have intricate, brilliant world building. And that is something, I don't care if it's an urban fantasy, I don't care if it's high fantasy, mid fantasy, what, whatever it is, even magical realism, I need the world building to be solid regardless. If I'm gonna read a fantasy book, the number one thing that I want from my fantasy is a good world. I need the magic to make sense, I need it to work, I wanna know the intricacies of it, all of that, and I didn't get it from Book of Night. And so therefore, what we got was a lot of like romantic subplot and mystery and dealing with these magical s characters that I just didn't care about because again, the magic wasn't there. The next five books we're going to go through pretty quickly because I have a dedicated video on these five that's going to be linked down below. That was the Books That Wasted My Time video that I did I think around four months ago. So if you want more in-depth complaining about these books, look in the description box down below and check that video out. The first one I'm going to talk about is Brother, which 
it was just one of my most disappointing books of all time. I have scarcely been so let down by a book and it was because Brother was the book that got me into reading Anya Allboard who is a horror author that I really really enjoy. However, I never got a chance to read Brother. It was the first book of hers that I heard of and I was like, oh my god, a cannibal family? Yes, yes, I love cannibals. I know it's weird, I love cannibal books. I really, really do. And so I was like, oh my god, A Cannibal Family, yes, give me that book right now immediately. I just couldn't find it on audiobooks and it was just too kind of expensive for me to buy. So I started reading her other books via audio and I really enjoyed them. I read The Shuddering and then I read The, the Neighbor Family or something like that. Both of them were really, really good and I finally got my hands on Brother, the book that put her on my radar. <sighs> Oh brother. This is a case of bad marketing in my opinion. Or not bad marketing rather, but just like bad descriptions of the book or a misleading synopsis. I don't know what you want to call it, but the book was very different from what I was told the book was, if that makes sense. So what Brother actually is about, just throw everything that you've heard out of the window. What this book is actually about is a boy named Michael. He's a teenager and when he's around five years old, he's kidnapped by this dark family. And the mother of the family is a cannibal and she is dark and twisted and everyone else in the family lives in extreme abject horror of her. Her husband, her daughter Misty, her younger son Rev, and then Michael gets brought into the foray. The mother has incredible appetites for torture murder, that kind of thing. Misty and Michael never grow up to develop these tastes, neither does the father, and the oldest brother, Rev, does develop a taste for this, but mainly out of wanting to please his mom, if that makes sense. So the only true villain in this book is the mother. She is the one pulling the strings, and this book is described as like a family of cannibals, like a dark twisted family. It's not that. It is literally just the mom and everyone else is just terrified of the mother. And so what I didn't like about this book was that for 300 pages, for just under 300 pages, we had to deal with everyone in the family just like whining and being scared of this woman and that wasn't what I wanted. I wanted like a dark twisted family. Michael, our main character, was the biggest crybaby in the world and don't get me wrong, I would be crying too if I were being forced to eat people people. Okay, you know what I'm saying? Like I, I do get it but it just was like a boring teenage drama. The brother Rev was just, he just needed a good ass whooping, okay? He was not the creepy older brother formidable villain that the book was kind of selling the brother out to be. He was the most disappointing thing I've ever experienced other than my father. It just wasn't it. The cannibaling element was basically non-existent. We had two cannibal scenes. I was so disappointed. I just couldn't, I just couldn't believe it. It ended up becoming a romance for some reason. It ended up becoming Michael being obsessed with this girl from the record store. Everything about the book, the ending, all of that, the plot twist, all of the drama that happened was crystal clear. It felt like on page one you were given a map explaining where we were gonna go and we went exactly where we were told we were gonna go. I didn't like it, it was it was so disappointing. I wanna make a video on the most disappointing books I've ever read, like of all time, and this would have to be in the top five. Then we have Grendel's Game, which I did a dedicated Waste My Time video on, and again! Again, another cannibal story that let me down. We were promised a cannibal serial killer who is sending letters to this cop and the cop is trying to figure out who the cannibal serial killer is. There's no cannibaling in this book. The serial killer sucks and it's transphobic. The plot twist is transphobic. It's just, it's, no. Nope, it was a sexist transphobic book and I'm never reading another book by this author. Next book. So the next book we have was Very Bad People. This was a YA dark academia book, again, that just let me down. It was just, oh my God. I'm trying to get through these books fast because I want, I'm really excited to talk about the top two most books that wasted my time this year. So again, if you want more in-depth reviews of these books, 
description box down below. But Very Bad People is about this girl whose mother tried to drown her and her two siblings when they were kids. And her whole town kind of has looked at her funny as a survivor of this event. The mother ended up dying herself because she tried to kill them all by drowning them all in the lake, you know, driving into the lake. She decides to go away for school in order to just escape all of these prying eyes and she gets pulled into this secret order organization club that's being run at the school and it's an activist club that has existed at the school for decades and decades and what they do is they secretly influence positive changes on campus. They set out to expose this corrupt teacher who has been preying on students and that basically is the plot of the book. So Calliope is trying to keep her own history from colliding with what's going on in the present and is also trying to figure out whether or not her mother's death was actually an accident or not, that kind of thing. The most disappointing thing about this book was some of the choices that these kids decided to make towards the end. As with most dark academia books, there's a murder. The murder was so far-fetched. The author was like, oh, I have to have a murder, and here we go. The reason for the murder, the execution for the murder, the way that the main character got pulled into the murder, all of that made no sense. It also threw everything that this group stood for out of the window. This group abandoned their morals that they have stood by for decades so quick. and the motivation just was not believable. The execution was not believable. The writing was just eh, it was just I, it didn't work for me. I gotta switch up my battery. Give me a second. Sorry if the picture changed a little bit. I decided to take a bunch of selfies. Sometimes I can be more vain than the ones in my arms. Ah yes, uh, the Spanish love deception. <laughs> <laughs> I've made so much content about hating the Spanish love deception. Like, I feel that that book has become my brand this year simply because of how much I hated it. I have a dedicated video on that. That'll be linked down below. I did, I literally did a dedicated video for Spanish love deception and an inclusion of it in books that wasted my time. So just know that that book was the easiest one star that I've ever given out. We get it, Aaron, Aaron Blackford is a large man. Where's the personality? I just don't understand why the bar is so low for tall white men. <laughs> tall, muscular, able-bodied, quiet white men. It just could never be me. <laughs> now before we get to our top two most disappointing books, worst books of 2022, I have to talk about a book that really, really, really deeply hurt me. <laughs> it hurt me the way that brother hurt me because I have been waiting for this book for years, years, years. It might have even disappointed me more than brother because it came from Claire Legrand and I have been waiting for another book from her since Saw Kill Girls in I think 2019, 2018. And I will keep waiting because clearly this was not the book I was waiting for. Extasia is a book where we are following a girl who is a saint and she is a part of a cult in the woods and what saints do is essentially they are seen as the pillars of their community and every so often when the city is feeling sinful they have a little party and they beat the shit out of these girls and the logic is by beating up these girls the girls are taking the sins and then the girls have to purify the sin. They're, it's basically just a bunch of men and women beating up on children. That's literally what it is. Men are starting to turn up in the woods with their bodies mutilated, I wonder why. One of the saints, the main character, decides to set out into the heart of the woods and look for these witches and to ask for the power to stop what's happening in her city, in her village, in her cult, whatever. I do love feminist, horror, I do love social commentary, I do love witchy books, I do love books that are set in the woods. It is sapphic and Claire Legrand has great atmospheric writing and that's one of the reasons why the book has two stars is because of Claire Legrand's gorgeous writing. The horror depiction in this book is phenomenal. Like, she knows how to tell a creepy tale, she knows how to set a scene. And unfortunately, that is all the good that I can say for Extasia. The feminist messaging was really, really, really really aggressive and I love me 
an in-your-face feminist book. I love a book with social commentary, but it left, there was no room for nuance, there was no room for the reader to glean anything, and the message of the book was just so, it was just too crystal clear, and that wouldn't have been so upsetting if it hadn't been made crystal clear multiple times on every single page. It was like, we get it, we get what you're trying to say. The other issue that I had was the ending and the, the plot twist. It was like someone else wrote the end of the book and this person hadn't read the first half of the book because it felt like two books had started on opposite edges of the field. You know, um, what was that game, Red Rover? Red Rover, Red Rover, won't you come over? And then they send a kid and the kid runs to the other side of the, the frickin' field. Basically what this book felt like was two books running at each other. <laughs> I can't remember if I talked about Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine, I don't think I have, but Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine, forgot to mention this. It, this is one of the most celebrated books that I've ever heard of. It has over a million ratings on Goodreads and I DNF'd this book so fast. I tried twice to listen to it and I just couldn't, it quite, quite frankly, it just bored me. I was bored to tears. And that was just the end of that. I think that this book is boring. Now let's talk about the top two most disappointing books of 2022, the top two books that I hated. And those books are Jackal and Arrow to the Moon. Both of these books were highly anticipated. The one that's gonna take the number two spot is going to be Jackal by Aaron E. Adams. Was very, very excited about this debut thriller from a Haitian author. I could not wait. I can't remember if Aaron E. Adams is Haitian or Haitian American. I think she might be Haitian American. We are following this woman who is kind of forced to return to a town that she fled from, another of my favorite tropes. And in this town, black girls are going missing and they are turning up like with their hearts ripped out of their chest and police keep labeling these deaths as animal attacks. <laughs> Factual footage of how police treat missing black girls. And so obviously this book is very clearly social commentary on the epidemic of missing and murdered black girls in the United States, which a lot of people don't realize is a thing, but it is a huge thing. It is a huge thing. There are a lot of predators and serial killers, not just, what was his face? Uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, not just Jeffrey Dahmer, he's far from the only one who specifically prey on black girls and black children because they know resources will not be allocated into looking for them. This is something that I did research on unfortunately in college and I had to take a mental health break from college after doing the research because it was that horrific. Long story short, this book was something that I was really really excited for because it hits close to home, it is a topic that I've studied and as a black person in America it's especially relevant to me culturally and emotionally so I was really really excited I love racialized horror because it's one of the ways that I work through my own trauma it's one of the ways that I get perspective and it's also one of the ways that I heal I love using horror and thrillers in order to heal and I've been saying I'm gonna make a video on this at some point but it, the, today is not the day right away I did not like the writing for this book and it wasn't specifically the word choice it was the conversations that were had in this book the dialogue and even the internal dialogue was just very odd to me a lot of it seemed unnecessary and random that was weird but it wasn't the end of the world just overall the writing though just did not do it for me it, it really wasn't setting the scene it really wasn't pulling me into the story I although I might be in the the weird category for this because so many people said that they loved the writing so take that with a grain of salt my biggest issue however with this book was the freaking ending it's like going to sleep to one movie and waking up to another you know when Netflix decides to just play it, an, another movie and take its own liberties that's that's what was happening. I felt like I went to sleep to the office and then woke up to the haunting of Hill House. I was like, what the fucking hell is going on? And I did not, I did not understand. I didn't get the ending and I could give props for the turn that the story took. I can't call it a twist because you kind of know what's going, the direction the book is going to take throughout the book. It's made very clear, so I'm not really sure that you can call it a twist. But the issue is that the end of the book jumps so far into another 
situation. Nothing is explained. And one of the things that I was thinking was, okay, well, maybe it was like the author was trying to leave an open ending or create mystery or intentionally leave things a little ambiguous. No, I love those kinds of endings. That's not what this felt like. It felt like the author also didn't understand what happened. Reading Jackal reminded me of that time when my father asked me what I wanted for Christmas and then didn't show up. Now for The Arrow to the Moon by Emily X. Pan. I have waited years for this book and when I heard about the announcement for this book, Chang'e and Hoi mythology based meets Romeo and Juliet, I was so excited. I could not be more excited. I mean, Emily X. R. Pan can release a grocery list and I would be like, you know what I mean? I would have been geeked for it. And unfortunately, this book it just wasn't it. So this is a YA mythology magical urban tale and unfortunately it missed so much for me. This was voted as a Patreon book club pick earlier on in the year. My patrons were super excited about this book. I was excited about this book and I'm not gonna lie, I think we all hated it. I can't remember a single one of my patrons being like, yeah, I'm glad that we read that. It is really, really unfortunate how much we did not like this book and I am heartbroken to say that this book, the only reason that this book was given two stars was the ending. The ending. First of all, I wasn't even, if you go into this book expecting the same, not the same story, but the same level of writing, that same quality of writing, that same powerful lyrical writing that you got from Astonishing Color of Actor, don't. Because I don't think that the writing is even comparable in these two books. Was the writing still good? Absolutely. But was it Astonishing Color of After? In my opinion, absolutely not. And I don't mean that in the sense of like, oh, I wanted the plots to be the same or whatever. I just don't think that the quality of writing was on par at all. Still incredible, incredible craftsmanship though. And again, if the writing had been comparable to me, I think I would have given it three stars because hey, hell yes, I, have, I consistently give books a whole star for the writing alone, even if I didn't love the rest of the story. These characters read very young. They honestly felt like middle schoolers. I like you. I like you. I like, like you. I like, want this to end. The dad creeped me out, not gonna lie. But the ending of this book was very sweet, very powerful. And in my opinion, it was like worth reading the book. I don't regret reading it, but because I think I always would have wondered, but the ending is the only thing that saved this book for me. So I ended up rating it two stars instead of one. That's it folks, do not forget to get yourself something from Ana Luisa, use the code BOWTIES10, get yourself 10% off, link is in the description box, snag some of these amazing pieces or other ones because they are not going to disappoint you the way that these books disappointed me. If you want some exclusive content from me, check out my Patreon. Every single month I make dedicated videos exclusively for my patrons, as well as a spoiler filled reading vlog for the book that we all vote on together. But if you're not interested in joining the Patreon fund at this time, all of my social media links are in the description box below so that you can catch me other places as well as a list of other ways that you can support my channel. Stay safe, be good to yourselves, be good to others, and I hope to see you in my next video.